Welcome to the Bucket Plan On Demand, a podcast for financial advisors based on the best-selling book and process that simplifies financial planning. Hear from skilled industry professionals and special guests each episode that will help perfect your approach with clients and your results. Welcome, everybody. We have a fun little topic here today. We we're talking about marginal tax traps, and I couldn't think of two better co-hosts with me here than Seth Meisler and Jeff Warnkin, both of JL Smith. And a little bit of fun history here. Jeff was the first advisor ever at C2P and somebody I've been so proud to have at the company. Just his background, CFP, CPA, master's in taxation, and Seth was somebody that I was so happy that last year joined us because just such another brilliant mind. Again, uh, Seth CFA, CPA. I think you have a whole slew of additional designations as well. So two people that I know love to geek out on this stuff. And so what we're going to talk about today is helping clients avoid marginal tax traps. And when I was creating the tax management journey, I remember reading a marketing article about naming things that get people's attention. And when you put the word trap in there, it gets people's attention. Like nobody wants to fall into a trap. I certainly know I don't. And so I remember naming this step on the tax management journey, marginal tax traps, because I think these are things that we as advisors can help our clients navigate at all costs. Because when I talk about tax management journey, I really share that there's only two types of taxes out there. There's avoidable taxes and there's unavoidable taxes. And when you get into a marginal tax trap, these are those avoidable taxes that we could help our clients eliminate. So Jeff, I'll just kind of start off with you. Let's talk about the basics, like what qualifies as a marginal tax trap, maybe a quick example of any and how they can impact your clients. Sure. Uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. And a pleasure to be with here with everybody this morning. So a marginal tax trap is really a, a change in your income tax that's not fully explained by the ordinary income tax rates. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to share my screen with you just real briefly. And what's going to come up, and Dave, you'll recognize this. This is right from the tax management journey, the, the famous measuring cup example. And so in this measuring cup, you see I'll take the 22% marginal bracket, for example. If a client is in the 22% marginal bracket already, and they withdraw another $1,000 from their IRA, you would expect them to be taxed at 22% and that that would generate $2,200 of additional federal income tax. Unfortunately, when you get into the marginal tax trap situation, that's not always the case. And the taxation of Social Security is one area where we get into uh, a lot of problems. Uh, I would, in this example, the, we were looking at the advisability of accelerating income and we're all doing a lot of that these days with planning around Roth conversions and things like that. So we were looking at doing a $50,000 Roth conversion. And what we found is that their tax actually went up by $14,000 based on a $50,000 conversion. And this example is right out of our tax software. So if you do the math, that's actually a marginal tax rate of 27, almost 28% on that additional income, which is not the result that you would expect intuitively when looking at the ordinary income tax brackets, because this client was squarely in the 22% bracket. So we need to be aware of these traps and make sure that our clients are, are fully uh, informed of what's going on and then avoid them if possible. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I always would share, hey, if you were to take an additional 10 grand out of your IRA, but you knew it was going to cost you 3,500 or four grand, would you think twice about it, specifically if there was a way that you could reduce that tax? And that's a great example of that marginal tax trap. Seth, I'll kind of turn it over to you and your experience. What do you see as some common scenarios where clients find themselves in these marginal tax traps and can they appear throughout different stages of life or financial changes that happen for the client? 
Yeah. So first, uh, I just want to thank you for having me here. It's an honor being here with Dave and Jeff. These are the guys who I go to for questions, as well as many, many others in the uh, C2P and JL Smith universe. So I would say when we're talking about t marginal tax traps, we're not talking about like having a couple dollars over like the 24% bracket into that 32% bracket. I mean, that doesn't really move the needle. But what we are talking about things are, you know, what, what Jeff showed is something that would show up on um, tax planning software. But then you have things that may not necessarily show up in tax planning software that I would say would be a tax trap. So one of the most common ones I see is like Irma and where, again, it's really punitive. If you have a dollar over that Irma threshold, you are now paying that higher Medicare tax. It's a, still a tax, but it doesn't show up as an income tax per se and doesn't necessarily show up on the income on the tax software. So you really have to take the information you're having from that and put it into like a spreadsheet or something else, some other tool to make sure that you're not inadvertently creating that type of tax trap. So that would be one kind of common example. Um, other ones would be other certain types of tax credits that you may phase out that again, wouldn't necessarily show up on because you're looking at prior to this year, but could be opportunities or life changes. So big ones in life changes would be certainly retirement and timing of retirement. Are you working part-time? Are you fully retired? kids going to college and thinking about what does that mean as well as maybe they're continuing to be a dependent and working part-time or earning income where you may not qualify for certain tax credits but the child may there are certain ages that are certainly important to keep track of 59 and a half 70 70 and a half when you can start taking qualified charitable distributions in the 73 and then obviously business owners, real estate, they have their own kind of universe to be thinking about. And the last thing I would say is asset location. Don't forget, I mean, kind of going back to the basics, asset location and where you're putting certain assets can certainly create unexpected tax situations or taxable income. I think the one that's most common to all of us is the social security tax torpedo right? And figuring out that, of course, not all social security is taxable and the taxation of social security is dependent on your overall income. And that could be a big surprise to people. The second one is because we had ordinary income tax rates unbundled from long-term capital gain and qualified dividend, there could be a marginal tax trap upon the sale of a capital asset like stock, mutual funds, ETFs, or as Seth mentioned, that if you have a portfolio that's kicking off a lot of dividend and interest income, that could actually push the client's other ordinary income into a higher marginal rate as well because of how that income stacking works. And then there's a whole bunch of situational things to talk about with clients. If they're a business income right now under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we have the 199A qualified business income deduction where only 80% of their income is taxable. But again, if you push them above a threshold, you can go from an 80% tax to a 100% tax. That's another big surprise for people. If they have incentive stock options and they're exercising them, they could be subject to alternative minimum tax. And there's thresholds around the AMT exemption that could push them into a higher marginal tax rate. And then real estate owners, right? Some of our clients that are retired might have a rental property. And if they're under a certain income, they might be able to deduct the rental losses as active income losses. But if they go over that threshold of income, now those become passive losses that get carried forward. And so like if you do like a Roth conversion, maybe with a retiree who has rental income that was writing it off as active, now it might get disqualified from active and go to passive. And if I sat here and brainstormed, like those are just some of the things that popped into my head as I was listening to Seth talk about this. But there's like, the bread and butter, social security, long-term capital gains, qualified dividends. But there's all these situational ones, QBI, 
rental real estate, stock options that we have the ability to help our clients navigate so they don't pay these unnecessary taxes. I think, Jeff, you were going to chime in with something? Yeah, uh, absolutely. All good stuff. I was, I was going to mention that, you know, again, situationally where we see what well, we're dealing with uh, pre-retirees and retirees in a lot of cases, uh, they might have children who are still in college and, and they're getting that American Opportunity Tax Credit. And if they get a bonus or, or if you are doing Roth conversion analysis and you blow up that tax credit, that's going to drive the actual marginal rate on that conversion right up through the roof. And that's something that you want to look out for. Another big one where we see is in our, in our early retirees, meaning retire people who retire before Medicare age, they might be on the Affordable Care Act and they might be getting a subsidy that lowers their premium because of their income. And if you do anything to increase that income, it will have a detrimental effect to that subsidy. So again, those are ones where you want to tread very lightly and, and make sure that you've got all that taken into consideration. And, and another big situation is required minimum distributions. Many of our most successful clients have accumulated a lot of money in deferred accounts. And the, it, it's kind of funny, the same people who have accumulated large qualified balances are the same ones that don't need the required distributions, right? And so as we know, at some point, they're going to they're gonna have to take this money out. And that additional income is what could trigger all of these, I call them stealth taxes, because at the end of the day, it's an increase in the net amount that you're paying out to the federal government, and it's not accounted for in the ordinary income tax rates. So again, just an awareness and um, make sure that you understand how all these things, it's not just a matter of saying, hey, I'm going to max out the 24% bracket. I'm going to take the client to the top of the 24% bracket and everything's going to be good. You, you have to take all these other things into consideration if you want to do the, the complete job. Jeff, I love that term stealth tax. I talk about it all the time in the tax management journey and with clients. And I always use the analogy like, have you ever gone to look for a flight to go on vacation and you see this really low cost fare by like Spirit Airline or Breeze Airline or something like that. And you click on that fare thinking you're getting a heck of a good deal to buy this flight. And by the time you check out, there's like 30 additional fees that have been added to your cost now. That's like these stealth taxes, right? The brackets that you see 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37 percent, that's like the fair price. But by the time you check out and do your tax return, you might find that these decisions that you made throughout the year cause all these additional stealth taxes. And that's ultimately what we're talking about here. Seth, Let's talk about any kind of recent or upcoming tax legislation changes that could affect how you're managing some of these clients that might fall into potential marginal tax traps. Any any ideas or thoughts on tax change, legislation change that could impact all of this? Yeah. So the good news is that there's nothing immediately on the horizon in terms of tax law changes, uh, certainly for 2024. And so that's a little bit of relief. The the what I've been hearing kind of through the grapevine is when President Biden is going to roll out his 2025 budget, issues that they're thinking about or that they've been kind of publicly talking about is trying to raise taxes for individuals earning four hundred thousand dollars or more. That's been a big one. Increasing corporate taxes from twenty one percent to twenty eight percent as well as doing some enhancement to the child tax credits. Those uh, seem to be kind of the big ones that are, again, like 2025. Looking out past that, the big date is January 1, 2026. And that's when our current tax law um, expires and goes back to the old rules. Obviously, we have no idea what is gonna happen with the, with the tax law on January 1, 2026 whether it's going to continue change or or whatnot but that's something to to be aware of i'd also say there's some odd phase out dates that we have so like the new electric vehicle credit that came into the the changed electric vehicle credit for 2024 
that expires in 2032. We have solar tax credits that we just got in this year, in this calendar year, we got new guidance on that makes it not nearly as appealing as it originally was. That can only be used for like C corps or passive income or real estate professionals. And then I would say the other big thing I think people need to be aware of is the Corporate Transparency Act. That actually is pretty major. So anyone who has an LLC needs to file that Corporate Transparency Act. Many CPAs are working on that. I would try and make sure that your client's aware of it. It's a pain in the butt. And hopefully their CPA will help them. Or again, that the client is going to step in and it's it's time consuming to fill out. But that's something to definitely be aware of and have that, at least have that conversation with the client, make sure that they are aware of that. By the way, any new LLCs that are created in 2024 have 90 days. So January 1 for prior to 2024 and 90 days if if you created an LLC in 2024. Well, I was just going to say to Seth's point regarding 2026, keep in mind that it, it as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, was legislated or put into effect, there's that sunset provision, which means we go back, unless they change it, we go back to the previous rules. So that means in 2026, which is not that far away, in many cases, we'll be itemizing deductions again. And in particular, the SALT limitation, the $10,000 limitation on state and local taxes is going away. Now, in our area, not many of our retirees are over ten grand and just on property taxes and state taxes. But in many areas of the country, that's going to be a, a huge change and a huge shift. Uh, so we need to look at that in terms of matching deductions and, and being able to accelerate income to do Roth conversions, but having other offsetting deductions to try to avoid these marginal tax traps. That might be one area where we need to do some some planning because the standard deduction is getting cut in half. And in, in many cases, we're going to be going back to itemizing in 2026. And I think now is such a great time to have these conversations with clients. Like, the reality of it is uh, politics is all over the media right now. I mean, the RNC has been going on. It, it ends tonight as we're speaking. And we pretty much know Trump's stance. I mean, the reality of it is if he gets elected, there's a good chance a lot of these sunsetting provisions will be extended, whether it's through legislation, if the Republicans control Congress and the White House, or if he does it through a means of like a budget reconciliation process like he did in 2017 to pass the original Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think to Seth's point also, we pretty much know where Biden's head is at. If if he gets reelected, he's made it pretty crystal clear he doesn't want to try to change taxes for people under 400,000. But for those over 400,000, taxes are going to be increased substantially. And so I, I love a quote. I took this from Dave Buckwald that he shared during one of the tax management journeys. He said, whether taxes go up or stay the same, the things that we're going to do today from an implementation standpoint are going to make you no worse off in the future. If we do some things today in 2024 and 2025 to proactively maximize your income, minimize your taxes, navigate some of these marginal tax traps and have a plan in place for if these current provisions end up sunsetting and expiring at the end of next year, you're in a good position. But again, if Trump gets reelected and he's able to pass laws that continue to allow these things to extend, you're in no worse shape. So why wouldn't we take advantage of these things today? And I think that's such a good message for your clients, no matter what their political affiliations or beliefs are, no matter what they think Congress may or may not do, why wouldn't we do things today to plan for the future? And if taxes don't go up in the near term or the long term, they're in no worse shape it's just we're taking advantage of things each year, like the measuring cups that Jeff shared earlier. So any questions, too, if anybody has any thoughts or insights or ideas, please, of course, as in all of these sessions, feel free to type them in the chat box or unmute your line. 
Jeff or Seth, I'd kind of open it up to either of you. Any additional techniques you find most effective around planning for marginal tax rate optimization? And also, I'll kind of pair that with anything you guys are doing to help educate clients on the importance of understanding tax brackets and that not all money is taxed the same and how you try to communicate some of these things with your clients. I would like to just chime in with a tool that I found helpful. And it's another concept, and I call it the effective tax rate. And the effective tax rate really cuts out all of the noise. So for me, it's the effective tax rate is your total federal tax divided by your total income. So it takes into consideration standard deduction and all of these marginal tax traps. What is my actual effective tax rate? And Dave, I know you've heard and we've used many times the expression, not letting the tax tail wag the dog. For me, even if clients are avoiding marginal tax traps, sometimes is not necessarily the goal. We want to be aware of them because in the example I gave before with required distributions, three, four, five years down the road, they may not be able to escape these marginal tax traps because of these distributions. So why not accelerate income now to get a handle on that, even if we're triggering some of those earlier, is the client better off in the long run? So sometimes even with those marginal uh, tax traps counted into the equation, if I can keep the client's overall effective tax under 20%, that's my benchmark. If I can keep the client's overall tax at 20% or less, I feel like we're going to look back on this 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and say, you know what? We we liberated all of that pre-tax money at an effective tax rate of less than 20%. That was a gift. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've touched on, but I just want to say more explicitly is, and I think, Jeff, you can agree with this, back in the public accounting days, the, the mantra, again, kind of whatever, 30 plus years ago or more was defer, defer, defer. Yeah. Like that was that was kind of what we learned kind of whatever in the public accounting universe at that point in time, the 80s, 90s. And that is no longer the case. It, it just doesn't work that way anymore because of the way the tax code is structured and these stealth taxes and how they're popping in and out and with required minimum distributions and changes in clients' life. And I think it's important to really kind of build out a multi-year expected income for the client. Like, what does it look like when RMDs start versus the year before or two years before? And why are we doing what we're doing? And what if you do nothing? And what if you do something so that they can see the impact of what's going on? And so you can kind of play with that. Again, we don't know what the taxes are going to be 2026, but we can model out what if it's the current race? What if what if it's the old rules? And look at the difference. So really kind of broadening that out over a multi-year so you can look at like your three to five year total taxes under strategy A and strategy B to see really what, what that is. So that's one thing. The other thing is, in my experience, I would say in the last two years, we have a national shortage of CPAs. So that's whatever, that's a fact. And in the last two years, I've seen more tax return errors than I think I've seen in my entire career, where I've had to go back to the CPA, back to the client and have them amend returns. Significant dollars, $80,000 of ordinary income that should not have been, I mean, just things like that. And I think we are, we as advisors are kind of being tasked now to really look at the tax return Compare it to last year. Is it reasonable to last year? Are there things on 1099s that would show up in the 1099, but should be excluded from the return? A non-deductible IRA contribution converted, that will show up in the 1099. A qualified charitable distribution showing up in the 1099. All kinds of other things. 60-day rollover showing up. All these other things that are showing up potentially in the 1099 that should not be included on the return or notated on the return are getting missed by the accountants, whether it's not being communicated by the client or something's happening. And so it really falls on us to really take a look at that and make sure that prior tax returns do make sense and they're done correctly and we're doing what we need to, we need to be doing. 
Yeah, I second that. I mean, the amount of mistakes we continue to see. I mean, we fixed one more recently where the prior tax professional fat fingered the Medicare wages instead of putting 250,000, put 2.5 million and nobody ever realized it. Right. And so like, these are the things I think that having a tax advisory side of your business, even if you're not doing tax preparation, like we're doing at Allison Wealth or the team is doing at JL Smith, But just making sure you're reviewing your client's tax returns, making sure you're not seeing any anomalies like two and a half million dollars of Medicare wages, for example, like those are the things you can add substantial value for. The biggest marginal trap is the one where you overpay a dollar of tax that you didn't need to pay. That's a hundred percent tax increase that you could have avoided, right? I don't think any of our clients want to pay a 100% overpayment in tax. And so the biggest of all of these is helping clients avoid these unnecessary taxes, whether it's to Seth's point because of a tax professional's mistake, or it's because They're getting bad financial advice about how they should structure their retirement income distribution or sell an asset like a business, a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, an ETF, and a capital account, or how they should structure their business income. So many people, even retirees, have side hustles generating a little bit of business income here and there. There's things you could be doing there. And so- I think there's just so much value we can be providing from a holistic advisory standpoint. And so with that, we're out of time. Jeff, Seth, I appreciate you both joining here. We have a tax management journey upcoming in September. I can't wait to see you all there. As always, I got new content up my sleeves that I'm working for there. And it's going to be a fantastic closeout to 2024 and a really fun 2025 because we have the media selling all of this stuff for us. Clients are paying attention to this and we can be out there capitalizing on it. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Bucket Plan On Demand, brought to you by C2P, an organization whose purpose is to educate, train, grow, and support holistic financial advisors so families can achieve true prosperity. Subscribe today for the latest episodes and insights. Visit c2penterprises.com to learn how we can help support and enhance your advisory business. At the time of delivery and any subsequent publishing, information was deemed reliable but is subject to change by the time of listening or viewing. The contents of this piece include options and projections of C2P, are subject to change, and are for informational purposes only. The information provided in this presentation is not intended to be individual investment, tax, or legal advice.